Did you know that slavery never ended? Most of us think that slavery is a thing of the past. But that is a lie. Slavery never ended. A common misconception among people is that any rule or regulation that governs them falls under one category, law. But there are many other forms of law that people abide by without realizing that they simply do not apply to them. Another misconception is that a nation's constitution gives us our rights. A constitution does nothing more than list the rights that we already have. We are born with inalienable rights, endowed to us by our Creator. They are not given to us, and they cannot be given away. The most a person can do with a right is choose whether to exercise it or not. Maritime Admiralty Law is what's known as the Law of the Water. It is superseded by civil law and only applies to those who willingly contract themselves into it. The definition of Admiralty Law is a body of private international law governing the relationships between private entities which operate vessels on the oceans. Let's look at how and why a form of law that is fashioned to govern corporations, businesses, and vessels has imposed its rule over natural human beings. This is all done through a form of word magic. A simple perversion of language has made it possible to convince people around the world that these alternative laws apply to them. One of the predominant beliefs in modern culture is that licenses, permits, registrations, and other forms of documentation are required to operate motor vehicles, use public roads, build structures and establishments, engage in free enterprise, and much more. Sadly, these beliefs are based on little to no investigation whatsoever, and are false. This belief structure is perpetuated by maritime admiralty law. This form of law was originally created to govern ships docking in foreign nations for the import or export of products and resources. It deals with banking and merchant affairs, not civil affairs. When a product is taken off of a ship and brought into a foreign land, that nation takes custody of the resource and accounts for it with a certificate. That certificate marks the birth date of that product in the custody of the respective nation. Think of why it is supposedly required to have a certificate of live birth in the first place. The Barron's Dictionary of Banking Terms defines a certificate as a paper establishing an ownership claim. So right there, we notice that everyone with a birth certificate is defined as being owned. The United States has always been, and still is, a British Crown Colony. King James I was famous not for just changing the Bible into the King James Version, but for signing the First Charter of Virginia in 1606. That charter granted America's British forefathers a license to settle and colonize America. The charter also guaranteed that future kings and queens of England would have sovereign authority over all the citizens and colonized land in America stolen from the Indians. After America declared its independence from Great Britain, the Treaty of 1783 was signed. That treaty specifically identifies the King of England as the Prince of the United States and contradicts the belief that America won the War of Independence. Although King George III of England gave up most of his claims over his American colonies, he kept his right to continue receiving payment for his business venture of colonizing America. If America had really won the War of Independence, they would never have agreed to pay debts and reparations to the King of England. When Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, the U.S. President was made subservient to the King of England. The 13th Amendment is called the Title of Nobility Amendment and forbids U.S. Presidents and their officials from using royal titles like King or Prince or Baron. For some mysterious reason, the 13th Amendment, which was ratified in 1810, no longer appears on current copies of the Constitution. America's blood-soaked war of independence against the British bankrupted America and turned its citizens into permanent debt slaves of the king. Or not. Until recently, we were all legally debt or labor slaves, as were our parents, our grandparents and great-grandparents before us. 
Since 1933 every new child born was required to be registered, thereby creating a corporate person, effectively denying that child any rights, as an owner of real property. The act of registering a child contracted them as chattel, and the birth record was a deceptive legal way of getting the parents to sign the baby away. The birth record was in fact a promissory note that was converted into a slave bond, which was then sold to a private reserve bank effectively giving ownership of the child to the bank. Each new baby's contract was sealed by either a drop of their blood or by an incompression of their foot onto the birth record. This signature was used to create their lifetime value, evidenced by their labor and the taxes and costs of that labor, as monetized currency all designed to keep people in servitude for their entire lifetime. The banks have been the modern slave owners, and as the saying goes, he who owns the debt owns the people. The way the slavery system was imposed on us meant that, even if we did end up paying off our house or our car, we never actually owned it, because our right to any real property ownership was given away at the registration of our birth. This has been legal process, since 1540 via something called a sesquicu vi trust, and this was still in effect until the recent UCC rulings changed the legal landscape, and reinstated the unrepeatable fact, that no one can own ourselves or own our bodies. The slavery system remained intact for so long because of educational doctrines, the influence of our community at large and because so many people accepted and embraced their slavery, by waiting for others to help them or to tell them, what they should could or should could not do. Enforcers like the police and courts made sure we stayed within the slavery system, and incarcerated us if we chose to live as free individuals. In fact, the slavery system was imposed on us all and maintained for centuries by building walls in our minds through propaganda and conditioning, creating a false belief that we did not deserve better, that we were not part of a greater plan, and that we should instead be happy with the handouts, crumbs and indulgences given to us by the powers that were PTW, while the system itself reaped in millions of dollars every year, directly from the sweat and blood. Where does your iPhone come from? We get them from stores or from online, but we are at the end of a long and shady supply chain. It truly starts with raw materials such as Colton, or enslaved children in Congo mined it for terrorist rebel groups. By buying an iPhone, you are fueling civil war in Africa. Then the raw materials are shipped to sweatshops in China, and the final product is assembled by people that are overworked and underpaid. Then they get sent to us. Greetings world citizens. Troubled times are opening up before our very eyes. For those unable or unwilling to put their bodies on the line, butting heads with the tools of the fascists, there is still non-cooperation. Number 1. Use cash. This takes control from the banks, costs them to handle, is mostly untraceable, can be used tax-free under some circumstances and its handling provides work. Not as convenient, but we have been selling our freedoms for convenience for a long time. Number 2. Only buy what you need and buy it from more ethical sources. Avoid products of the transnationals who oppress workers in near-slave sweatshops in poor countries. Number 3 Be smart. Play dumb when it suits. Wake up, wake up, wake up.